Excel before we dive in. So Health Excel, we support the leading organizations to make better decisions in digital health. We have, we do this through a specialized advisory team that sits here in Dublin um, an insights platform. And lastly, the experience and the intelligence of our expert community, some of which we are really excited to have here today to answer some of our clients' questions. Today, this webinar will be recorded after it will be available on the platform in a couple of days, as well as the key takeaways from today's session. If anyone would like to ask any questions, please, we really encourage that. Please use the chat function and we'll get to your questions um, at the back end of the webinar. Now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Tess to set some background and give some context for this discussion today and introduce our expert panelists. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, well, I suppose 2023 really wouldn't be complete if we didn't end a year with a conversation on artificial intelligence. So this year arguably turned into the year of ChatGPT. We've seen this technology really take off in an unexpected way. Over the past few weeks, the world has been watching the leadership changes at OpenAI, and literally everyone is now talking about the potential, the opportunities, but also the dangers of this technology. So we really wanted to get in on this conversation, reflect on the latest developments, but I suppose mainly give this audience a very pragmatic and multi-perspective view on AI and more specifically how it can or should enable a positive experience in a healthcare setting. We're not really here to talk about the hype, but we want to be a little bit more pragmatic. So today we want to discuss how stakeholders are deploying AI-driven strategies to reshape the patient experience and improve outcomes but also to understand some of the issues and bottlenecks of deploying AI in this most critical field that is healthcare. There's really no better group to lead this conversation than our newly formed advisory board for the Health Excel AI in healthcare and life sciences community. We're delighted to be working with this formidable group of advisors who represent the provider, health systems, pharma, and big tech perspectives. But before we start the conversation, I'd really like to hand it over to our panel to introduce themselves to the audience. So Ami, uh, Kristen, Jeremy and Janaid, please briefly introduce yourself to the audience with your name, uh, your, your title, and also maybe by mentioning maybe one thing about AI that you really like. So um, I don't know who'd like to kick us off, maybe Ami, you're first on my screen. Great, well, thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to both be here and to be working together with Health Excel. Um, so Ami Bhatt, uh, I'm a cardiologist by training. I'm currently the chief innovation officer the American College of Cardiology. We're a global organization that represents uh, about 57,000 uh, cardiologists, nurses, administrators, uh, and executives. And um, one thing about AI, you know, I think the, the thing that excites me the most is watching over my career in medicine, how much we can achieve, the kind of knowledge we have, um, the data that we can get on people, the individual personalized data, one thing that's always worried me is that our ability to do science is exceeding our ability to deliver it. And I think finally, um, AI is getting us to a place where we can actually deliver the rigorous scientific care that we are now able to provide. So I think that's probably the most exciting thing for me. I'll kick it over to Kristen next, maybe. Thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Myers. I'm the Chief Digital and Information Officer and Dean for Technology at the Mount Sinai Health System. and. I'm really excited about AI's ability to, you know, innovate and, you know, improve the patient experience and care. And, you know, I believe this can be a competitive differentiator in the marketplace for providers. Yes. Jeremy? Hi, everyone. Uh, Jeremy Foreman. Uh, I am the executive director of the enterprise data and AI, AI team at a small biotech uh, in Seattle called CGEN. Um, my, the thing I'm most excited about, I guess, or, or what I find so interesting is just the, and kind of it's the theme throughout is just the creativity that unlocks for, for everybody, right? Like just creative ways to solve, um, uh, existing problems or to really leapfrog the way we've tried to solve problems in the past. I just really think it's exciting to, to really, uh, enable a new way of thinking. Um, I'm, so I'm excited about that. Awesome. And last but not least, Janae. Hi, everyone. I'm Janae Badger. I'm a physician by training and background and the global chief medical scientist at Microsoft Research. Um, it's always difficult to go last because everybody else has stolen your ideas and it's much, they all sound much cleverer and much more articulate than what I would have said. But perhaps two things. One is 
in the immediate term, automating the mundane. So things that are really boring, um, that used to take me a long time, now don't. And then maybe on a slightly more non-healthcare related note, just seeing how my kids, my 10-year-old and my 13-year-old are really playing with these technologies. Because really, I think the future is theirs and what they'll be able to do with them will be a lot more than what I will ever be able to do with them. I love it. Thank you so much. And you're so welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have you here today. So Tess kind of touched on the hype of AI. And there's a lot of ambiguity about what AI can actually do for the patient experience. So I wanted to stop here, get your definition as to what AI is in relation to the patient experience and get some really interesting, tangible examples from each of you now and your respective organizations and industries on some examples of how AI is helping the patient experience and enhancing it currently. So Kristen, I love what you said that AI can be you know, a strategic differentiator for providers. So I'd love you to kick us off with that question. And I'd love to see, you know, with your health system perspective, Active, where do you see AI adding most value to improve the patient experience currently? Sure, I think AI can really enhance and automate and optimize the patient journey. You know, we all want the patient experience to be seamless and personalized and equitable and lead to a better quality of care. Uh, we want the processes to be streamlined and to improve patient satisfaction. So Currently, uh, what you know, we are utilizing um, AI for really around virtual health assistants and chatbots to improve patient engagement and communication, um, workflow optimization, so reducing administrative burdens around scheduling and billing, uh, in-basket messages to the physicians, uh, clinical documentation, as Janaid said, automating the mundane. And then clinical decision support, I think leveraging AI and ML models to provide actionable insights and evidence-based recommendations and real-time data analysis. You know, they're the practical use cases of, you know, how we're utilizing AI in our health system. Thank you, Kristen. And it's nice to see such a broad range of solutions being implemented at Mount Sinai. Is there one of those areas that you see currently having the most value between the automation, the admin, the virtual bots, the clinical decision support? Is there one you're most excited by? Look, I think that, you know, from a physician uh, wellness uh, perspective, you know, the in-basket uh, automation um, of draft messages, I think is a definite time saver um, some of the areas around clinical documentation and the ability to summarize that immediately, I think that, you know, really impacts uh, physician wellness in a positive sense and reduces the amount of pajama time um, that mm -hmm. they're spending in physician documentation. I also think that, you know, some of the clinical decision support, you know, we're um, looking at you know, models around uh, sepsis, deterioration, um, you know, all of these have got, you know, high uh, return on investment uh, to uh, our financials. So again, those areas I'm also very excited about. Okay, that's great to hear. And great to hear the HCP, where they're excited, where it's alleviating their roles, because that can in turn then impact patients. Um, Ami, I'd love to kind of stay on this provider thread and I'd love to hear from you. What kind of current examples are you seeing that are really kind of adding value to the patients? Yeah, so um, I'm going to echo and then uh, I was told that it's okay if I challenge a little. So I'm going to do both Absolutely. right now, might as well. <laughs> Um, so, so the first is, I think absolutely, uh, clinicians are tired of facing their back to a patient while typing into a computer. That's not why we went into this profession. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ability to really, you, you said chat GPT, Tess, when you were uh, introducing us, but I think that's really one of those places where voice to text can be extraordinarily helpful. And so I think it's going to be great. Let me give you the challenge, which is um, I walk around saying this is going to be great our physicians and our nurses are gonna be able to face their patients, really interact, the note's gonna be done by the end of the clinic visit. 
Is that entirely true? No, every practice is going to have something that they're need, going to need to work on to make it actually work. There will be bumps in the road. It will not be an out-of-the-box solution. And I think that's the hard part for clinicians to understand is that this is one time where technology will not just be ready. Um, we are essential in actually making the technology work better for us. And it's a new approach because right now clinic flow is, is all about the patient and getting the health care done. It's not about improving the administrative or caregiving or workflow process. Um, we're not used to implementation science and iterating. We can iterate with patients about patient care, mm -hmm. but we're not used to iterating process. It's not been part of the job description. So, so it's a little bit of a cognitive load to now have that responsibility. We refer to it as collaborative intelligence. When we bring AI to medicine, whether it's clinical decision support, administrative, et cetera, we need to know what's going into the AI that's helping us. We don't have to be AI experts. We just need to be enabled. We have to know what's going in. And then we have to iterate on what comes out. And so it is a new cognitive load for our profession. Um, mm -hmm. And it won't come as easy as Janaid said, as, as to my kids. My kids are like, what cognitive load? Like this is how we live, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I think that's one thing. The second is, um, and I, I may put it back to Kristen just for a second. I used to run outpatient cardiology at MGH. And when our wait time started going up, it was a clear you know, um, delegation from the president of the hospital system hey, I'm going to go fix that, right? It was, well, Dr. Bot, you know that you're going to bring those wait times down, yes? And I was like, yes, of course, sir. However, when I then look at AI, I think, gee, if your note's done during your clinic visit, can each of you get two or three more patients in the day? Can you do that for access? Can you do that for our patients? It's the right thing to say. I just want to point out how it might feel to a burned out provider. So a little new cognitive load, maybe ability to do more work because you're more efficient, and so those are some of the things that people are seeing. We just have to be conscious of it as mm -hmm. we improve the system. So, so maybe I'll pause there because we'll, I think, come back to clinical decision support later in the discussion. Um, and maybe kick it back to Kristen just in terms of thoughts or I saw Janaid smile. I don't know if anybody else on the panel has thoughts about that. Look, I think that the point that you make around um, productivity is always going to be one that, you know, health systems struggle with. And you know, but again, you know, our focus uh, right now has really been around um, physician wellness and utilizing it, you know, to reduce the amount of time that they're documenting. Because, you know, as you know, I mean, so many physicians are documenting three or four hours at night. And so if we can reduce that time uh, that they're spending at night and so that they can uh, spend time uh, doing what they want to do with their families, I think that, you um, the wellness um, will will improve. But mm -hmm. I, I understand your point about productivity because, you know, the more productive uh, physicians can get, the more revenue comes to the health system. Yeah. And, the, and the more patients that can receive access, right? And so right. it's, it's both mm -hmm. revenue, but it's also patient access because, you know, we have a growing older population of multi-comorbid disease. It's funny, just one quick thing. Um, we often talk about how do you know a physician is burned out? And I think it's just relevant to what you just said about the nighttime and the pajama time, which is you can only ask one question. If you wake up in the middle of the night, what's the first thing you look at? And if it's your Epic in basket on your phone, you are burned out, right? Mm -hmm. Just one question, that's it. I, I see Janae smiling there. Um, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Amy. I think these are really important insights. And I want to kind of bring it back to the patient for this conversation. And I think, you know, it's obviously really important that we discuss the HCP there, the person that's interacting with the patient most. But two very interesting that you mentioned is CDS. So I'm assuming in turn the patient is receiving earlier, better diagnostics. And maybe we can talk a little bit later as to whether that's the case. And then you mentioned something very important to me is sometimes that we think that this reduced burden in terms of admin notes will translate to reduce wait times. But really, these physicians are burnt out and potentially increasing their load of patients isn't always going to happen. So maybe we can get into that meat. But I'm just conscious to bring it back to the patients. But thank you so much for those insights. Maybe, Janaid, I saw you kind of smiling and nodding uh, with that conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then I'd also love to hear from a big tech perspective. Are there any kind of examples of collaborations in the space, partnerships in the space that Microsoft has done or big tech has done that come to mind that have really positively improved the patient experience in relation to using AI and those partnerships and collaborations? 
Yeah, no, happy to try. And I think I was just smiling because I empathize and sympathize, I think, with both what Kristen was saying, what Ami is saying. And then you can bring it back into your own personal experiences, right? So the IHI talk about the quadruple aim, the quintuple aim used to be a triple aim. But within those aims is improving the provider experience in addition to improving patient experience mm -hmm. yeah. whilst driving equity, population health and uh, improve value for money, essentially. Um, if, if I think about the patient experience, I, I wonder whether we could double click on what that actually means, because I think it means different things to different people. And I might choose to, to, to double click it down into aspects of safety, quality and communication. So on the safety side, I think there's a lot of research emerging around how in a world where we don't have enough doctors, nurses, pharmacists, healthcare professionals on the planet versus what society needs, increasing demands, but no abeyance on that demand. How do you manage that through innovation and technology? And how could a cardiologist like, like Ami or a, a primary care physician or a general internist um, actually manage that incoming demand in a safe manner? And could AI help us? And we've seen through some of the things that are being announced at RSNA this week, but also what's happening in radiology workflows, mm -hmm. that there are mechanisms in place by which these tools can drive safety and hopefully quality and highlight those people that absolutely must be seen and have higher human in the loop versus others that still need human in the loop, but less interventions. And so we should maybe think about how that can drive a patient experience. At a very simple level on communication, um, I'm often, and this is something that I reflect on, when I see a patient and I'm communicating with them in clinic, I often assume a reading age that is similar to somebody who would in the UK be able to read The Guardian or in the US perhaps read The New York Times. But actually the average reading age is not that. The average reading age is much more like an eighth grader, ninth grader. And could we use some of the generative AI tools to make us better communicators? And in so doing, drive better safety messages, quality messages back to patients. So if I'm asked to provide the side effects of uh, the Bigotran or whatever it might be. I mean, there's a big leaflet that I guarantee nobody reads. And then there's like the safety alerts that come, which are confusing. How do you communicate that in a way that makes sense to a 12 year old, a 13 year old? And so there's a massive opportunity to think about the role of health literacy through these technologies to drive that. Um, you asked around the big tech side, our, our mission at Microsoft is empower everybody and every organization on the planet to achieve more. We're not a CRO, we're not a pharma company, we're not a provider, mm -hmm. but we wish to create generalizable tools, which I think many people are using to empower them to uh, have the best output that they could have. And so we're working with a range of organizations, be they foundations, charities, providers, or otherwise, to provide them with the technology that they could use on the use cases that are most important to them. And hopefully some of those examples have come through in, in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sinead. I think that communication example is a really kind of nice one that we, that doesn't always come to mind, but if anyone's used things like OpenAI recently, you can definitely see how these tools will help. Um, and then last but not least, Jeremy, I'd love to think about, or I'd love you to explain how you think about AI as it relates to patient experience in CGEN, and if there's any practical examples of you using AI to improve the patient journey. Um, and, and this will be more pharma industry wide, not CGEN specific. Um, and you know, there, there's just so much excitement uh, as most people can acknowledge pharma has been slow, I think, to adopt the technology. Um, I think that what uh, Ami said about uh, the cognitive load is, is very much the same within a, a research setting. Um, adopting technologies, um, kind of a, um, a form fixation, kind of a, a design bias that, you know, people are so used to doing things a certain way after, you know, 10, 20 years to to try to do something differently is there is a cognitive load and it's going to take time for that adoption. I, I do think the cultural challenges are the biggest, um, but the, the the area that I, I think about most in terms of the patient experience, I mean, drug discovery, for sure, there's a ton of money being invested. It's very exciting what's happening within with AI coming up with new molecules, um, new, new targets. It's, it's very exciting. Um, I, I think the space around clinical trials might, might be the area that could, uh, with the with the massive uh, investment in drug discovery, I, I this idea of a pig in the python problem, right? This idea that we can come up with a bunch of molecules, a bunch of new INDs, 
But if we can't execute clinical trials fast enough, which means getting patients um, involved, uh, enrolled in, in clinical trials and staying in, in, enrolled, so recruitment and retention, I mean, the, the numbers aren't very promising right now. I think AI could have a really big impact. Uh, over 300,000 clinical trials, only 5 to 10% of eligible, eligible patients uh, were aware of the studies. Um, 30% mm -hmm. of patients drop out um, due to non-clinical issues. Life happens, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then from a diversity perspective, um, the, you know, even the, the in, at least in the U.S., um, two to sixteen percent of trial patient trial patients are are from a diverse background. So I I do think AI had, is going to have and needs to have uh, a very large impact. I think we're at the beginning though. I think that there are a lot of companies just in the past year that are implementing uh, solutions within their platforms. Uh, startups uh, springing up. I think we're still early. Um, the, the you know. Early on, uh, I think we're early in our implementation of things like virtual patients. So you can simulate, do computer simulate, simulate, simul simulation of, of trial efficacy and safety, those sorts of things to maybe streamline the, the, the process so that it doesn't take 12 to 18 years and $2.6 mm -hmm. billion, dollars, which leads to high drug costs mm -hmm. to get a, a really important medicine to people who need it. Thanks, Jeremy. I think there's some really, really interesting use cases there. And it's great to see the communication come up again. Is there one particular use case at CGEN that you're most excited about, be it drug discovery, clinical trials, general communication? Yeah. And again, I'm going to try not to be CGEN, CGEN specific, just more For yourself, general. personally. Yeah. Yeah. I do think virtual patients uh, is is something that we're just getting at the, the beginning of. There are a lot of um, data privacy questions that have to be resolved, a lot of uh, regulatory uh, questions that have to be, be solved since there isn't a lot of guidance yet from, from uh, regulatory agencies. But I do think that that virtual patients have the opportunity, uh, the, the, that's the area that I'm most excited about and seeing it um, kind of percolate in the industry. Right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Amy, I see you have your hand up. Please feel free to ask your panelists a question. And Jeremy said so many good things. Um, two of those things uh, that just made me think about some efforts that, that a lot of us have been working on. The first is when we think about equity, um, I think it's important to recognize that in delivering health care, we have been less able to address social vulnerability than we would have liked. And I think the ability of AI, meaning large data algorithms, right? To be able to direct us to help actually achieve healthcare, not just by this is the best meant for this patient, but this is the best mechanism to get this patient to be aware of said medicine and then you know, be in contact with us to get it. Um, I think that's really important. And so I think that's an area where kind of data algorithms and eventually AI can be helpful. I think the second is, and you were talking about a virtual patient, Jeremy, but earlier Kristen talked about a virtual assistant. And there's some great trials looking at virtual assistance um, at the time of discharge, which is a very challenging time in the hospital for anybody, no matter what their kind of um, health literacy level is, especially if English is not your first language. And so I think that's been one area where we've seen really good success in hospital systems that have employed kind of virtual assistance. So again, sometimes navigating the healthcare field itself is the barrier to achieving healthcare. Uh, and I think that's an area, and I just kind of want to double click on what Jeremy said, where we can achieve a lot, whether it's an actual delivery of care or recruitment for trials. The one thing I have a good friend at the NAACP who always reminds me is that our existing data, however, suffers from structural racism. So we do need to think about how are we going to create the new data that we're going to use? And it goes back to collaborative intelligence, right? We have to be responsible for the data we put in. And we have to admit that probably some of the data we have is is not actually mm -hmm. going to lead to equitable care. Um, so just, I always, anytime I'm enthusiastic about equity, I remind myself that we have some work to do, but thank you for letting me come. Thank you, Amy. I think again, some really nice practical examples and it's really nice to see where you're seeing success and it doesn't necessarily have to be as we think about delivery of care. It can be the practical applications of discharge from hospital that can really improve, improve the patient experience, which is great. Janae, yes, please come in. I mean, I mean, just triggered a thought, which was 
if the other bit around patient experience that is helpful, if you think about the workflow of a clinician is you come and see me, you have a consult, I'll probably order some investigations. Those investigations make sense to me, but they're gobbledygook to, to others. So if I think about pathology results or full blood count, we've seen through a number of experiments that actually you could put your uh, blood counts into GPT-4 Bing today and say, help me understand these. And it will give you a very reasonable understanding in, of what those the interpretation of that might be. And you can also put in uh, like statements, I suppose, from your insurer to understand your claims and say, actually, how do you make sense of this? And actually, those are empowerment tools in my mind, which disintermediate at, at some point, but also empower the patients and public and society to better understand the medical processes of investigations, management, insurance claims, etc. And I think ultimately to improve the patient experience, there's a proxy to think about how empowered patients, public and society are in their own healthcare, which is probably something that we may wish to, to dive deep into. Mm. Um, yeah, Junaid, I think that, that actually leads me quite nicely to, to a different line of questioning that we um, have for today. And it really kind of builds on that empowerment piece because I think kind of fundamental to that is probably, you know, needing to trust uh, that technology as well. And I think, you know, from the conversation so far, We've touched on the fact that you know some cases are um, a little bit more mature others a little bit less so but as ai grows more influential in our lives and many of us are thinking about you know the ethical behavior of technology i suppose a question that comes up is how do we build trust in technology that is really poised to play a significant role in our healthcare and with which we likely need to interact with on a much much um larger scale so maybe Junaid, I'll actually ask this first question to you because I think um, you know, there's probably a huge role to play here for technology companies, but how do we reconcile AI and human values and what can technology companies do to foster greater trust on the part of patients? Uh, I think that is a big, big question and it becomes increasingly important as we think about the responsible nature of AI development, the responsible nature of AI deployment and the responsible nature of AI regulation. So there is um, quite a long uh, series of uh, thought pieces and um, emerging work in this notion of responsible AI that is probably worth thinking about around how do we think about privacy, security, safety, heterogeneity of data, and a range of different things in order to really drive responsible practices across all of the above. I think trust is very difficult to earn and very quick to lose. And so whatever you do has to be done in a responsible manner um, and you have multiple players in this so there is a role that big tech has there's a role on engagement that i'm sure Kristen has to think about from a provider perspective there's probably a role that uh, colleges and uh, societies and uh, professional groups such as the one that ami represents have to think about as well but it all comes down to i think a set of core principles around responsible practices and how do we define them, measure them, implement them. And if we identify things are going awry, be brave enough to raise that issue and mitigate against the risk because we are entering a brave new world with some of these things. And there's also a lot of negative noise out there around the potential of some of these. So active dialogue, conversation that drives trust at every level is going to be really, really important and consistency. So if the medical profession or the clinical profession or well, the healthcare institutions are not buying in and are not changing their practices and are not adopting it, it'll be very difficult, I think, for us to think about patients adopting it in advance of others. But these technologies will also be ubiquitous outside of healthcare. They will be as part of our banking engagements, our restaurants, our booking, our, our flights. Once they're ubiquitous in society, I think health and life science organizations will be duty bound to implement and think about how they build the processes in for trust, legitimacy and access moving forward. I think the part that you mentioned, Janaid, about the rest of life is so important. We often think about healthcare as a silo. Um, we recently, so, you know, Netflix happens to be kind of a big thing in our house. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if this happened to anybody else over COVID, but we recently started something called um, ACC Anywhere. And it's educational videos. They are short, they're easily consumable, um, but they learn. They learn what you like, what you know, and they also learn what according to your profile you probably should know, but maybe don't and start to sprinkle a little bit of that in. And the uptake there has been phenomenal, very different than the, we put videos on the website, we're sending them to your email every morning. It, it is extraordinarily different. And so I think 
there is an advantage to thinking about where in other sectors of the regular human life are we very comfortable using something and starting to think about can healthcare use the technology in a similar way to do that. Um, I'll add before we pass it on to Kristen and Jeremy, just two things about what you said. One is to get people to trust us. I think we need to set really low expectations. Like this is not going to work the first time you use it, period. It's not going to work perfectly for what you consider perfect. Is it going to be safe? Yes, that's our intention. But if you notice something, tell us. And then I think the second is, and we say it a little differently than you just did, Janine, but it's the same thing. Measure what you're doing. Be transparent that it did not work because it will not work perfectly. And then iterate on it, right? So measure, be transparent, and iterate. And we just have to get used to that. Um, and that's what I mean by low expectations, right? We just need to get used to the fact that it it needs us. AI can't do things alone. Um, and so we have to be in the middle of it. Yeah, interesting. I yeah, I never yeah, it is so ubiquitous in every facet of life. So hopefully it will kind of help where healthcare is concerned. But maybe um Kristen, to get your take on that, what or how are you thinking about the trust building piece, maybe from a kind of you know, uh health systems point of view? Sure. So within our organization, um, we're starting with education. So really understanding and disseminating information and education around you know, AI technologies and how we can benefit from them or how it's going to improve a care outcome and also the risks associated with it and, you know, potentially equity issues um, that can be associated with it. So I think important uh, to include clinical evidence and research studies as well uh, when discussing uh, AI uh, from a clinical perspective and you know, getting people's collaboration and feedback on this. Uh, we've also uh, set up AI governance across the health system um, and are putting together you know, policies and you know, forums so that you know, we can create guidelines, uh, we can review any new AI technology that's coming in from uh, across the health system. And, you know, that we're tracking the value realization associated with it. The last thing we want is to deploy an AI model that, you know, is not, is, is not going to support um, our uh, equity mission in the organization or that we're placing uh, models from various companies that are doing the same thing potentially and giving outcomes to our physicians uh, that are different. So I think that, you know, making sure that we're very uh, transparent about the process, that we have, um, you know, this governance process and, you know, we're getting feedback, um, active feedback about it is really important. We have not started um, any uh, patient engagement and communication, but I do think that, you know, that is really going to be the next step around, you know, engaging them in conversations about AI and addressing their concerns and, you know, really articulating uh, the health system's stance um, around, you know, our ethical principles and governance around AI and compliance with regulations. Um, and, you know, just opening up those mechanisms with our patient experience team to get feedback on AI um, from our patients. So I think it's a work in progress and uh, quite frankly, a lot of work to do in this front. Yeah, certainly. Um, and Jeremy, I was gonna ask you anyway. Yeah, but... yeah, I'll just, I, I mean, I, I, I'll um, agree with, with everything. And I think it goes back to Ami's uh, point earlier about collaborative, collaborative intelligence, I believe was, the, um, you know, it, because it, we are, this isn't a cognitive load. I mean, patients are, the trust is really between doctor and patient, uh, and not necessarily a pharma company and the patient, uh, or, or I, I, I mean, I, th that is, that is there, but I, I do believe that that is, it, it's just, if, if the trust isn't there with the doctor. And so I, I do think that for pharma companies, you know, same thing, transparency, explainability in our models, where are we, where are we using AI, um, um, start with places that are lower risk instead of, uh, of course, higher risk, um, but that ongoing education, and I, I believe it, it's um, because uh, as we've discussed this, uh, and AI, generative AI is going to be embedded in everything we do. I also think it starts with the, 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 um, the, 
employee base within a within a pharma company. I mean, that, you know, you have to understand um, how how to use AI, what it means to your work. I mean, just building that empathy is is incredibly important. And I that's where I I, I see the biggest challenge. I, I think I said this before, but I, I do see the biggest challenge and in, in culturally um, because companies need to invest, I think, pretty heavily in in kind of cultural change around AI and Gen AI for for embracing it and building empathy for their for their customers or or their their teams for the healthcare providers who are going to try to maybe we'll do more clinical trials. Well, what does that look like to an HCP who's just now trying to figure out how AI is is helping you know it, it, it exploding the world? I, I just I think that that awareness that collaborative intelligence I love that phrase of me is is really the critical piece here um, to um, to to make people comfortable in in trust AI. Thanks, Jeremy. And uh, Christian, me, Jeremy, Janae, you kind of answered our next line of questioning around the patient experience in those answers. So thank you so much. It's really interesting to see how you're thinking about educating the physicians and making sure that the patients are aware as a next step and opening up those feedback lines. Um, something I'd love to double click on now because it's kind of come up organically is how do we know that the AI is doing a good job in relation to patient experience? And I mean, I love that you mentioned, you know, you measure, you reiterate, you set the expe expectations from the start. And Kristen, your focus on getting feedback from the patients. Maybe Janaid and Jeremy, if you want to uh, jump in here, Amy and Kristen, if you want to add anything else in. I think there's a lot of talk about AI, but sometimes not a lot of talk, talk about you know, whether it is improving outcomes, what's good, what's bad, where are we at? So I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, I, happy to start. Um, I, uh, right. um, it, it, you know, I think it does come down to, to, to measurement, both qualitative and quantitative. I mean, I think we can um, get, I think, I think feeling uh, around the AI the world of AI, I think we've tried in the past to not uh, per, um anthropomorphized technology i actually think that we're, we're we need to do that more with with especially generative ai so i think feeling like if you're asking a patient to enroll in a clinical trial with a a virtual person right i think the the qualitative side of that is really important how does that make them feel um and also the, of course, measure the impact. Are, are you seeing more eff uh, efficacy in clinical trials? Are they more efficient? Are, are more patients getting access to orphan drugs? Those those sorts of things. Um, it, it, it's really, uh, I think it's it's critical, and it goes back to transparency as well. That 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 is not it's not always lagging. That people kind of know up front what their what their where how how their data is being used. Um, how is it being um, managed uh, and um, and and again, uh, just understanding and having that transparency into uh, how, you know how the, how they're um, contributing to enhancements around AI. It's a different thinking as well. Like if you're part of a clinical trial, you're not just participating in that clinical trial. You're helping to influence other clinical trials that that come behind that uh, mm -hmm. um, potentially across a, a broader disease uh, a set of diseases and that that's a different like no people don't think that way right I, I think that that's a that's going to be important too so how do you measure that and how you be transparent for sure I re really like that thank you Jeremy and I suppose in it's very different in areas like drug discovery clinical trial recruitment we can maybe see those numbers and see those targets or see those recruited patients and then in areas such as communication it might be softer it might be a lot of reiteration like you mentioned to me um in terms of knowing whether the AI is doing a good job or not Sinead I mean Kristen is there anything else like you'd like to come in with the only point I would make is you know with any um technology you know you need to put together metrics of success and mm -hmm. you know how are you going to define it and you need to be able to look at you know if a patient is using a chatbot are they getting to the end of the workflow you know is it giving them the answers that they need 
and or are they abandoning it you know halfway through the workflow and you can see with the metrics so again you know defining metrics of success understanding you know what those baselines should be but then getting feedback um, from the patients through you know either forums with the patient experience team you know and just understanding is it actually solving uh the 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 problems that we wanted it to solve uh, i think is really important because you can put out technology uh, but if it isn't solving actual issues and problems um, or roadblocks um you know it's it's not creating value mm -hmm. and i love that Kristen, particularly when ai has been the shiny word of the year, every solution now seems to have AI in it. So a really practical approach as to what is the problem we want to solve and what is the fit for purpose technology. And we're not using this because it's um, a technology that we feel like we should be. Sinead, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I, uh, maybe a few just quick thoughts. One is, I think we should not necessarily at this stage of our understanding of all the different applications of AI, generative AI, think about generic measures, because I think at the application layer, at the use case layer, there'll be different ways in which you demonstrate safety for drug discovery versus how you demonstrate it at an outpatient clinic versus what we think about a discharge summary versus what we think about other things. And so getting a good discipline around AI safety as a principle and then leveraging that at the application layer, implementation layer, I think will be really, really important. And that might just be a, a core principle by which how we might want to, to think about these things and not just say all rules to all things, because I think it's going to be different flavors. And we're still relatively early on. I mean, there's a gazillion things that have had FDA approval. How many of them are actually within clinical practice today versus actually the number of approvals that we have, which I think demonstrates the challenges that we have around putting these into clinical practice or any form of practice. Um, and so we just need to think about that quite carefully before we say a broad brush stroke on many of these things. Thanks, Sinead. I absolutely, you know, the technology is there, the approvals are there, but really the adoption is poor because of a lot of these challenges. So I think it's a, a fantastic point to make. And we are talking about very broad technologies here. Um, I mean, I saw you nodding along. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah. First of all, I, I will give a shout out to the FDA. I think they have done a great job uh, recently of really thinking about how much sits on the shelf and how can we collaborate with institutions, clinicians, technology companies to get more into practice. So I, I just want to say, I think Janae's right. And I think the FDA is aware too. Um, going back to thinking about metrics and how we measure patient experience, I wanted to maybe just iterate one warning or opportunity perhaps that we have now. When we think about um, outpatient visits, when clinicians are seeing you know, their patients and then patients give their experience score, um, these are based on things like the provider listened to me. They, ex they explained things nicely. They seemed knowledgeable. Great. And then if you'll notice in those metrics is they were on time to see me and I got an appointment in a reasonable amount of days or weeks. Those two are not really about the clinician at all. They're about the system. And so I think one important part of the trust and the adoption of AI is really taking responsibility in the broader sense for what reflects on a patient's experience with the clinician, what reflects on a patient experience with a system, what reflects on the patient experience because of the technology and its user interface. And I think we have to differentiate those as we create metrics, because otherwise we might create a situation where there is, rather than collaboration, a little bit of consternation about why people are being measured. So I would just throw that out to anybody who's listening and thinking about creating these metrics. Thank you, Amy. I think that's a uh you know, really interesting. Again, another very practical example. I'm going to ask the panelists one final question and then we will move to our Q&A. So I wanted to get your final thoughts on what do you hope either your company or your industry, be it pharma, tech, will accomplish in three years time as you know, in relation to improving patient experience with AI. I know we've said that adoption has been a challenge, but what do you think are maybe some realistic accomplishments we can expect in three to five years time? Maybe Janaid, I'll start with you. Well, that's a tough one. Um, 
there's a paper that I wrote on it actually, which I'll send I'll send across. That might <laughs> be helpful too. because because I it's it's that whole classic Bill Gates quote around how much we overestimate and underestimate around what we can do, right? Um, it's been extraordinary for me to see the level of adoption, and I think for most of the world to see how much adoption OpenAI has had in a very short space of time, mm -hmm. and the number of experiments that are running. But we need to understand those in the context of healthcare and in the context of regulation. So I hope within the next three to five years, we begin to see broader application of these tools beyond research into some form of translation in the clinical development space in trials. I hope that we begin to see application. And I think Kristen and team are le really leading the way at Sinai or, and amongst other providers to see what does it mean to address physician burnout and how can we deal with low, uh, low complexity, low risk areas of healthcare which are not patient facing. And I think we have to learn and build the muscle to address low complex, low risk areas, mm -hmm. HR, finance, um, procurement, legal, all the business of healthcare, if you will, and build that muscle whilst we're experimenting, researching and translating what it means on the clinical side. Um, and I hope that we can make significant progress over the next three to five and take some of those FDA approvals and bring them into practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janae. It's very ambitious, um, but it's nice to see that the hope is there that we can take that technology and actually implement it. Thank you so much, Sinead. Um, Kristen, would you like to answer the question, what would you hope health systems like Mount Sinai can accomplish in the next three to five years as it relates to patient experience? Yeah, look, very similar uh, to Janaid. Um, You know, I would hope that, you know, the physician burnout uh, challenge can somewhat be addressed uh, through the utilisation of this technology uh, to be able to, you know, just reduce the administrative burden. Um, you know, and, you know, when you think about, you know, our research mission, uh, the ability uh, for, you know, clinical trial recruitment, uh, the ability for drug discovery, I think, uh, you know, that the possibilities there are endless and, um, you know, could really result in, you know, patient um, patient outcome improvement um, and significant ones so that to me would be uh, very exciting and I hope that I hope that we see that occur thank you Kristen it sounds like you're on the way to it with uh, the physician burnout so thank you so much Ami, I would love your thoughts again from a provider perspective. What do you think is a realistic accomplishment that you'll be proud of in three to five years down the line? Yeah, um, I think we will most certainly be able to achieve some decrease in administrative effort um, at the kind of clinical practice level. And I think it'll differ according to which institution buys which technologies and and what the greatest burdens are, you know, in, in which types of care delivery systems. So, but I think that that will happen in the next probably 12 to 18 months, not even three to five years. I think our ability to create better health literacy and partner with our patients. Uh, we have a very kind of paternalistic or maternalistic approach in healthcare that is now changing. And so as patients become more engaged, you know, one of the things we talk about is, is it's really not consumerism, it's patient agency. And that's how we have to treat it. And I think the advent of AI, the advent of generative AI, um, a lot of this is going to push us to really see our patients as partners um, and to have them hold some responsibility too. Um, and so I think that partnership is also gonna grow over the next three to five years in a way that it hadn't before because the access to these tools, technologies, knowledge was just not pervasive. And then I think the third thing is we're finally less siloed and it's lovely, right? Because you need the entrepreneurs and the tech companies to talk to the health systems people, to talk to the clinicians on the ground who are doing the work, keeping the patients at the center. And at the same time, we also need the regulatory bodies. We need the venture capital people who are putting tons of money into things, but do you wanna put money into something that's gonna sit on a shelf? No. And so I think none of us wanted to be siloed. Um, and I think this evolution of really collaborative work uh, is, is changing and I hope that it continues. So maybe my third is a hope that people continue to see the value in that. And as we do more work together, we're actually gonna be far more effective in improving our patient outcomes. Thank you, Ami. I think 
that is just so important. And maybe we will build the foundations in the next three to five years for that true cross industry collaboration. And um, I also love that you mentioned the patient agency. Patient choice was something big that came up at a meeting a couple of weeks ago that we did with Princeton with a lot of senior leaders from the Health Excel community and giving that patients now choice in their care. So um, it's great to see that reflective in this discussion too. Maybe Jeremy, last but not least, from a farmer perspective, what do you hope you could accomplish in three to five years down the line in relation yeah, to patient um, experience? I, I think um, number one, uh, personalized oncology medicine. Um, mm. uh, that's, uh, I don't know, three to five years might be too ambitious, but I actually, I, I also think with all the money, the VC money that's being, uh, uh, um, that's flowing into the industry. I, I think that's something that we will see. Um, I love the the phrase Junaid said, automating the mundane. I, I see a lot of potential in the, over the next three years. I think a lot, we'll see a lot in the drug discovery process, a lot in the clinical trials um, er, arena. Um, but lastly, I, I think at the end of the day, the, the AI is only going to be as good as our data um, I, I think that's a, it's, people recognize that, like Ami said earlier, there's structural racism built into our data. My hope in the next three to five years is we have better data. Um, and maybe there's more of a free, free flow of protected private data across organizations to help our AI models uh, eliminate that bias um, and be able to actually make, make better, more confident decisions. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm so glad you said that. I think we could do another webinar exclusively focused on the data and it goes hand in hand with this AI. So thank you for bringing that up. And it's related to, I suppose, Amy's point about these collaborations and data is a big part of that. So thank you so much. Um, so what we'd like to do now is take some questions. Some have appeared in the chat and for the audience, please feel free to put some more in the chat. Maybe Tess, if you have any ready, please feel free to ask the panelists. Yeah, and I think it's it's kind of related to what Jeremy just started talking about. But the first question uh, that's come in, and I think again it, it ties us, uh, it ties up quite nicely with what we discussed at the very start. I mean, um, when we think about an AI making clinical decisions, how do we balance using a potentially biased AI, i.e., trained on available data, versus an AI that can learn beyond available data but be potentially out of control in quotation marks? that we do not understand how it's making um, decisions. I um, I can start that one. I think the first is we do need people to be somewhat AI enabled in that you know, chat GPT is a very different approach than using you know, machine learning for our radiology scans, which is very different. And thinking about um, seeing connections that the human eye can't see. If you tell me that somebody has liver cirrhosis based on an EKG, I have no idea how you got that information, but it turns out the research convinces me that's absolutely true. Um, and so that is a difficult part for us to think about. The out of control, I'm gonna answer the second part. I'll leave the first part for Jeremy. The out of control is an interesting phrase. I'm glad it's in quotes because there's not per se anything out of control. It's a lack of our understanding, the connections that the computer is seeing. And it is not ever going to be something where we can justify it clinically. Um, and so that is an area where I hesitate actually to think about using AI in clinical medicine in the near future, in the next three to five years. I don't think we can have black box algorithms that don't correlate with what we as clinicians are comfortable telling patients. I, I don't think we're ready for that leap yet. Now I wanna bring up something different though, which is, Sometimes there may be, let's say I'm not great at giving aspirin to certain patients, right? Pick, pick a drug. Um, I might be an ideal person to get a little bit of AI that says, hey, based on the following guidelines that are well-established, that are transparent, that I can convince you that this algorithm came up with the right idea, you may want to think about it in these people. Let's get your percentage of aspirin prescription up to what it should be according to guideline-directed medical therapy. We know that there are guidelines for medical therapy. We know that we don't meet them really anywhere. Right? There's nobody who has 100% GDMT, um, and especially in cardiology. And so I think those are places where is there a way for us to think about, hey, can we augment you in an area where you need some augmentation? And can I leave you alone where you always do it right? 
So that's the kind of measurement that we might need to start next to be able to trust AI for clinical decision-making is let's just look at your decision-making. Where could you use some help? Where are you excellent? We don't want to tell people they're bad all the time, right? What are your strengths? What are your areas of potential growth? And then can we implement the AI in that area? I think that is one way we can make sure that our AI is in fact helping us and slightly, not completely, gets rid of the bias issue, which is we already know that the care you're providing is somehow biased in some way or not you know, fully up to par in some way, and we're going to do this to help you. So I, I wonder if that's the way I would kind of reframe that concept of where we're going next. I like that, um, a really, really elaborate answer. And I suppose, yeah, kind of, yeah, I suppose, yeah, the 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 kind of black box, the not understanding, not being able to kind of retrace some of these decisions really does kind of get get in the way. Um, curious to see um, or to hear, uh, Kristen or, or Jeremy, if you have um, any insights on this. Yeah, no, agree, agree with Ami, especially on the point around, you know, AI models where you don't necessarily understand the connections, but the computer does. Um, for, you know, AI models right now that are trained on available data, you know, what we do is, you know, run them silently in the background. Um, Mount Sinai has got a, an extremely diverse data set. And, you know, we have, you know, run up um, on models where, you know, they have only been trained on, um, say, uh, an all-white uh, Midwestern uh, population. And then when it comes to Mount Sinai, it doesn't work uh, in similar ways because of our, our diversity of patient populations. So I think that, you know, running these models silently in the background before you're actually putting them into practice, understanding the results um, is really important uh, from a trust and transparency um, perspective, uh, especially with our clinicians. They have to understand it. Uh, only thing I'll add to this is uh, um, it, it, that to build confidence, the, 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 if, if people have gone through the, the process of actually building a solution for a specific domain, like you're building a, uh, a, a, a virtual assistant or research assistant for a drug discovery organization for a specific disease, to get to a level of confidence um, and trust, I don't think people necessarily have, uh, really appreciate how hard that is. Like it's a, it's a, actually a lot of work, right? Um, and you need a lot of SME time, su subject matter expertise time, to actually work with you, um, because we're, we're it's not it's it's not generalizable. Uh, it's not like going into ChatGPT and asking asking a question. So it takes a lot of work. And I, I, I 100% agree with both what Kristen and Ami said. Um, is I, I don't see a time in the next three years where AI is going to replace a doctor in making those types of decisions. Um, it's just, it's, I, I read a recent study, I can't remember where it is um, or where I read it from, but the, they, they found that ChatGPT, the GPT-4 was very accurate on very niche specific diseases and very bad at very common diseases like the cold. Right. And so um, I, I just, I, I think that there's just caution in terms of Think, thinking that in the next three years, a doctor will be replaced with decisions. I I, I, I love Ami's um, example around aspirin. Maybe there are lower risk or risk areas, but I, I don't foresee the out of control. I, I, I think that's, that's uh, I think it's good to be be aware of that, but I, I just don't see that happening in the next three years. We're, we're just not there yet and our data is not there. I totally agree. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And it's so important to set those expectations. I see we're just at time. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to our panel of experts for being so generous with your time, your vision, your ideas, your examples. Thank you so much. It's hugely appreciated. Um, the notes in the recording will be available on the Health Excel platform in the coming days. There's a lot of conversations happening, roundtables, masterclasses on AI throughout Q1. So please, any of our audience members, come and um, join any of those discussions. And our global gathering in June in Amsterdam is going to be exclusively focused on AI as well. So it will be a great opportunity to continue the conversation. Thank you so much again to our panelists. It was wonderful to have you um, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.